So this is something I've been really excited to talk about with Jamplay. The summary of the lesson is to be able to outline the changes to a common chord progression. It doesn't get any more common than a 12 bar blues. It's something that we have grown up listening to. It's pretty much etched in our skulls, you know, like our parents listen to it, their parents listen to it. Like it's a very uh, American old school progression, you know. It's all dominant chords, so it's kind of got its own special thing going on. But the biggest misconception about uh, the 12 bar blues really, in my opinion, is um, the first thing is the form. A lot of guys are like, let's play the blues, and they're just like, you know, you know, till the cows come home. But really, there's more to it than that. Um, it's 12 bars, and the first thing I want to do today is I want to go ahead and show you the progression um, in its most basic form, and then we're going to decorate it with some cool stuff that just doesn't sound cowboy and generic. Um, so. With that being said, the 12-bar blues is something that is uh, very misunderstood. It's very simple, but there a lot of times when you play a blues with somebody, like I said, they're just going to go for like the cowboy or whatever, like just moving this, this shape around, when really there's a little bit more to it. Um, the 1, the 4, and the 5, that's the progression. And the 1, 4, 5, they're all dominant chords. So um, when I was kind of coming up as a player, I always wonder why I ran out of ammo. I always felt like I ran out of ammunition, like, you know, like, Oh, I sounded good, but then I just kind of went off the tracks and it just kind of started sucking real bad, you know, just sort of, sort of sounded like I was noodling, you know, or what have you. And, uh, well, that's really the point. Um, the point that I got to was I was really frustrated and I was thinking, like, what is it, you know, what is it with me that I can't really just kind of bring out what I'm trying to bring out here and make music out of it? Because I heard other guys do it and they were amazing at it. And the first thing I realized is I was more concerned about soloing over the progression than I was actually eternalizing the progression. So I want to show you all right now a regular 12 bar blues with just regular dominant chords. Um, and I would like for you all to eternalize that and know exactly when the changes happen. Because if you learn this once, you can play a 12 bar blues with anybody around the world. That's the, that's the beauty of it. So. Here is the 12 bar blues in its most generic form. Four counts of chord, and we're gonna do it in uh, quarter notes. And then it repeats, okay? So really, I mean, that'll even pass for a, a good jam. You know, you can throw that into somebody's face, and even if they play for, like, the best musician in the world or they are the best musician in the world, they're going to get into that, and it's, it, they're going to be able to outline those changes. And that's what I'm hoping that we can talk about and kind of get to the bottom of today with all, with all this stuff. Let's now talk about how to outline these changes with arpeggios and the exercise that I do every day that is um, it's pretty demanding. It's pretty tough. It should be alternate picked and it's kind of endless, but that's cool because it's a challenge. Uh, I call this more bang for your buck, pretty much. Um, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to simply talk about the arpeggios that um, correspond with each of these chords, and it's going to be, at first, within a 5 fret radius. Just so happens, okay? Uh, so the first arpeggio uh, for the 1 is going to be this guy. Okay, now the next, uh, let's do that slow. That's much better. One more time, slow. Okay, now you should be able to hear this next change go to the four. Just by me playing the arpeggio, you should be able to hear without any chord accompaniment, you should be able to hear the four happen, and here it is. Back to the one, so you can definitely hear. Pretty cool, right? And uh, so the five is gonna sound like this. four, back to the one. Okay, so we just went around the fifth position and we discovered one, three, five, seven, I'm sorry, one, three, five, flat seven uh, from each chord, the one, the four, and the five. 
by doing this and cycling through the changes and making sure that you don't break your stride um, if you play eighth notes, if you practice this in quarter notes, if the chord changes, don't just start over. Be able to play the next nearest note that would be applicable or that would correspond with the next chord. So if you're playing like in eighth notes, I mean, what I'd recommend is playing to a metronome. And um, you don't want to break your stride. You want to basically cycle through the changes as if you're cycling through the chords. You want to hear the chord inside of these single notes. Um, without any accompaniment, so that's the goal. So if I was to kind of jam around with this idea, Um, okay, so I, I mean, that was really loose. Um, I'm definitely going to try my best to tab that out in its entirety. Um, but really, that was just kind of me improvising with the arpeggios. It's not the end all be all. You don't necessarily want to just create music with arpeggios. It's not going to sound really uh, musical. But um, the point of the exercise is the more you internalize this idea, you know, you're going to wake up one day and you're going to go, oh, okay, and you're going to be totally in control of, uh, of really outlining these changes. And like I said earlier, a few uh, sessions ago, um, if you resolve on a chord tone, a primary or secondary chord tone on the one, one, two, three, four chord change, you're going to show the listener you know exactly where the chord is. And that's, that's the whole objective for this uh, lesson series here. On to the next topic of discussion when it comes to outlining these chord changes in a one, four, five. Um, I want to make sure that you all know uh, that. <laughs> Go back to the last lesson we just did, triads, how important triads really are in this situation. The same thing that I talked about earlier with, um, with playing chord changes and doing substitutions like you know the, tr the diminished off the major third, if it works with the scales, if it works with the arpeggios, it's going to work with the chord just as well. So with that being said, if I was to play over like a regular blues again, you can pretty much play a diminished triad off the major third. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to play the one, or I'm going to play A7. Go into the four, and if you look at the four, you'll notice that right inside of there, there's very much a tritone. Once you find that tritone, I mean, you should pretty much be able to see, you should be able to see where the diminished falls, okay? so. So we can do this. There you go. You know, I just do a major triad in there for the, the one. And that's just a really good way to, to kind of move about and experiment with a one, four, five that's just not very conventional. You know, it's very like Django Reinhardt inspired. Um, but a lot of gospel guys do it too. If you're jamming with somebody who knows what they're doing and you start throwing diminished with the major third at them, they're probably going to give you a high five and you're done playing. They're probably going to be like, yeah, yeah, cool, you know. I wanted to give you all some final notes about how important outlining the chord changes really is, okay? And when it comes to a listener in an audience or when it comes to a music appreciator, somebody's just listening to a CD, a lot of times you may think to yourself, like, why is this important? Why do I have to really outline the changes when there's a lot of artists out there that just sort of, I mean, look at Alan Holdsworth. He doesn't exactly outline the changes in a very welcoming way. You know, it's very mad scientist sounding with that guy. But nonetheless, he definitely has a way to play the changes. As, you know, he has his own way of playing the changes, and I really respect that. Um, when it comes to playing the changes and letting the listener hear that you know the progression, believe it or not, even if you're a stale player, you're going to have a leg up on like 90% of, uh, of, of musicians, in my opinion. I think that... Um, even on my bad days when I'm playing, uh, if I at least can just outline the chords and go through and practice and outline the chords of triads or arpeggios or scales or whatever, I feel like I'm, I'm a step closer to being where I want to be. You know, the goal for us all to do this exercise, we should all have a goal that should be um, to be able to play this and improvise with single notes but still hearing 
chord accompaniment without there being chord accompaniment. So in other words, um, I'll just jam real quick and kind of give you guys an idea for better or for worse. <laughs> You know, I, I'd hope that you could hear the blues inside of that, even though I was, I was kind of getting a little notey there. Um, but that'll pretty much conclude today's lesson on outlining chord changes uh, in a very common progression. That common progression is a 1-4-5, uh, a.k.a. the 12-bar blues. Once again, be very sure that you learn the formula to the 12-bar blues. You learn the format, because if you really learn that and solidify that and just have it in your head the whole time, it becomes second nature, and when you jam with somebody, you don't have to show them the progression, they know it. You know, we should all know this progression because we've heard it since we were, you know, little children or whatever. So that concludes today's lesson on outlining the chord changes in a 1-4-5, otherwise known as a 12-bar blues.